the third use of the law. What? Again? <laughs> Members of COP, President Egger, Reverend Professors, colleagues, brothers and sisters in Christ. Why do I want to talk about the third use of the law again? Answer, I don't. <laughs> like many who have written doctoral dissertations, in the end, I secretly hated the subject. I'd had enough of it. But I was not to be left alone with my secret hatred. My book, Law, Life, and the Living God, was published 22 years ago, and it generated a lot of discussion at the time of its public, uh, publication. There were seven book reviews in print, and there were a couple of others in the electronic media, I believe all of which are available on the CTSFW media site. A couple of symposia on the Lutheran Confessions at Concordia Theological Seminary for Wayne dealt with the third use of the law in the first decade of the 21st century. On those occasions, I felt like I had a target on my chest. The third use of the law continued to be a hot topic through the first decade of this century. The increasingly bizarre plunge of the ELCA into overt paganism has highlighted for us the outcomes that follow on a rejection of an ongoing use of the law. Where the law is dropped from the theological program altogether, the gospel itself becomes a casualty. I couldn't help but think of the pithy dictum of H. Richard Niebuhr, a god without wrath, brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through ministrations of a Christ without a cross. That statement is truer today than when he made it almost 90 years ago. Of course, there is the ongoing debate, and we'll hear more about it, about soft antinomianism. I know what soft serve ice cream is but it remains ice cream. What makes soft antinomianism soft? It's like saying, oh yes, we have some soft heresy for you here. <laughs> antinomianism leads to indiscipline and libertinism, even if that is not what is intended by the antinomian. Yes, of course, we're offended by the fact that so much preaching we hear in our church body is just so much legalistic claptrap. I get it. But we should not act like Luther's drunken German who, after falling off the horse on the right side, climbs back on and falls off the horse on the other side. We do not rightly counteract a false teaching simply by saying the opposite. Legalistic preaching is not repaired or repelled by rejecting the law's proper use. Nor can we dismiss the rejection of the third use of the law by pleading that those who reject it are not yet advocating libertinism. Roland Ziegler made a valiant attempt to rescue Werner Ehlert and Steve Paulson from the charge of libertinism. However, if you relax one of the least of these commandments and teach others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't sound like a good thing to me. When you say that the law no longer applies, what do you think will happen? libertinism of some stripe or other will inevitably result. Being the cause of libertinism is not the same as intending to cause libertinism. The result is the same, however, or even perhaps worse because it's masked by your own good intentions and yet there remains wreckage in the church. 
of course, we now have people populating the unaffiliated Lutheran organizations. Pastor Shearer mentioned one of them in his speech, who claim that their personal breaches of the law qualify them as more powerful preachers of the gospel of radical forgiveness. I, for one, have had enough of these folks. When one of them offered a Facebook post in which he purported to tell the rest of us how to be good fathers to our children, it struck me that one of the main requirements for being a good father is staying married to their mother. You know, it's a fourth and sixth commandment kind of thing. You may be radically forgiven, but you don't get to teach the church any longer. To reject the third use of the law would be to risk antinomianism. This judgment, which I made in Law, Life, and the Living God more than 20 years ago, seems to me to have been proven out again and again. It is obvious that antinomianism is the gift that keeps on giving. Battling about antinomianism is an integral part of the battle over law and gospel. Perhaps one representative quote from Luther will do. Why study law and gospel? Luther says, I, and this is, by the way, 1529, so this is neither early nor late Luther. I have been teaching and studying this subject, the distinction between law and gospel, with all diligence for many years, more than any one of those who imagine they know it all. By the way, he's preaching this at the Marburg Colloquy. In preaching, writing, and reading, yet I cannot boast of having mastered it, and I'm glad that I am still remaining a pupil with those who are just beginning to learn. For this reason, I must admonish and warn all such as want to be Christians, both teachers and pupils, that they guard themselves against such shameful delusion and surfeit, and understand that this subject is most difficult and the greatest art that can be upon the earth, so that even Paul had to say that it is an unspeakable gift, that is, one which cannot be described among men with words, so that they regard it as highly and dearly as it really is in itself. So far, Luther. So maybe it's not such a bad thing, then, to be uh, continuing to study the subject, for we do so for the sake of the gospel. Let us again repair to the sources of our theology. Let us be humbly taught by those whom the Lord has sent to us with his word. I am intending in this presentation to look at texts, both biblical and confessional, that those who reject the third use of the law could never conceive us as sustaining a third use of the law for Christians after conversion to faith in Christ. The first use of the law, of course, is the law without the gospel. That is, it functions with threats to coerce those who care nothing for neighbor or for God. The second use precedes conversion by being the pedagogos that, that drives us to see our need by destroying our own self-righteousness. The third use would be to follow upon the conversion of the Christian, and this remains the sticking point among us. Those who reject the third use of the law, like Gerhard Ferdy, often claim that there can be no law after the gospel. Ferdy was not constrained, of course, by the Bible's own teaching and pattern because he was simply and deeply committed to the historical critical method of interpreting the Bible. However, since we are not enslaved by this anti-Christian interpretive method, let us look at how Paul orders law and gospel in the book which is the Magna Carta of Christian freedom, the letter to the Galatians. If any book should categorically reject law after the gospel, it would be Galatians. However, when we look at Paul's argument there, this cannot be sustained. Paul is arguing the priority of the gospel 
in that it was given to Abraham well in advance of circumcision. The priority of the gospel is the basis for the argument that the gospel is superior to the law and that the message of the seed is the sole basis for salvation. If gospel is prior to the law, it is a matter of fact that the obedience of Abraham to the law of circumcision is law following justification. Circumcision functions here just as we think of the third use of the law. Circumcision is a sign given by God. It is therefore God's law and it testifies to the merit of the father of faith in the presence of humans, not in the presence of God. Yet, uh, so you cannot argue that this law after justification is meritorious in the sight of God, for that, of course, would contradict the gospel. And yet, it remains a law after the gospel. As Paul argues, the law, which came 430 years afterward, of course, he's talking about the giving of the Ten Commandments, does not annul a testament previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. Galatians sustains the law following the gospel for a believer like Abraham and therefore for every believer. This is the third use of the law. Let us consider law and gospel as the Lutheran approach to theology, preaching, and pastoral care. Let us begin, of course, with Dr. Luther. Luther says that those who do not have the distinction do not have the gospel. He says, the Jews immersed in thoughts about the law pay no attention to the promise and make no distinction between law and gospel. Indeed, they have absolutely no knowledge of the gospel. They persecute and loathe it. The proper knowledge of the law and the gospel and their proper distinction is essential to defending the gospel. Notice that it is a proper distinction, not an absolute distinction. So the law and the gospel are not separated or one or the other is not abolished, but distinguished in specific ways. Of course, some of this is about proper definition. The word gospel could, of course, refer to the first four books of the New Testament. My six-year-old granddaughter went through that this morning in her homeschooling. What are the first four books of the New Testament called? They're called the four gospels. Those books include both law and gospel, of course. Gospel could also mean the entire proclamation of the Christian faith, Luther will distinguish the evangelical view of the monastic life as being obligated to the spiritual councils by saying, now quoting Luther, the gospel commands all men, always, in all situations, to yield, submit, and obey. So here Luther is using the word gospel in a very loose sense in which the gospel commands. Here, gospel means the whole body of teaching, perhaps, or just even the law. When we use the word gospel as distinguished from the law, we're speaking of what God has done for us in Christ, who by his atoning death and glorious resurrection has paid for the sins of the world. Among Lutherans, this is what we mean by the word gospel in the majority of cases. Gospel as opposed to law. Luther, like Melanchthon, of course, will use the commandment promise distinction as well, quoting now again from Luther. But the first saintliness must be referred to the symbol, to the creed, for I do not take hold of the promise of the word through the Ten Commandments, nor do I do so through the Lord's Prayer. But with them I grasp my love and my works. Through faith, however, I take hold of the word, that is, purity itself. These things cannot be adequately stated and inculcated. Yet there is an easy distinction between the commandment and the promise. The word which justifies the believer without any love and my righteousness is one thing. It is something else when I take hold of the commandments of God 
so that I do not steal, do not commit adultery, etc. Luther distinguishes between command and promise, yet also clearly says that we Christians grasp love and good works by the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer. What is that but the third use of the law? Lutherans are interested in the correct meaning, not the correct words. Verbal differences do not necessarily imply a difference in meaning. So it's kind of foolish, in my opinion, to talk about the fact that Luther perhaps never uses the term third use at all. The question is, does he use the third use, is what is the question. So in this case, of course, Luther is schooling us in the proper distinction between law and gospel. Luther will use the distinction between law and gospel to highlight that works cannot make right in the sight of God. Therefore, there will be the distinction between law and the kingdom of Christ in which there is no work and no merit. We do not reject works, but we do reject hypocrisy, says Luther. Luther does not reject works. Works, of course, are meritorious. Just not meritorious in the sight of God. Hypocrisy for Luther is to shove your human works in the face of God as though they were meritorious, just as meritorious as the work of the eternal Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So it really becomes a first commandment problem, doesn't it? The distinction is a theological boundary dedicated to maintaining the pure gospel in the church and to sustaining the true office of the mediator Christ, who is given true glory when we despair of the value of our own good works in God's sight and abandon ourselves to his mercy. The distinction becomes a theological principle or law, if you will, for the defense of the pure gospel. The law and the gospel distinction is a principle that demands the exclusion of human works from any talk of grace. Um, I think what I'll do for the sake of time is move on from this and go to the next point. To confuse law and gospel is to lose Christ and his mercy. Again, quoting from Luther. It is necessary, therefore, to learn well this grand distinction between law and grace. We must distinguish between the office of Christ and that of Moses, placing each into his proper sphere and not confusing the office and work of each, as we all did until now and as some still do. I myself was befuddled by this for over 30 years. Christ in his mercy has, um, was hidden pardon me, from my eyes. Moses still has his proper sphere, but Moses dare not stick his nose into the gospel. Luther's on-again, off-again opponent, Jan John Agricola, could be excused for his views about law and gospel because in his unsubtle mind, he was taking Luther to proper and logical extremes. In his Galatians lectures, Luther would say things like, now, if we are dead to the law, then the law has no jurisdiction over us, just as it had no jurisdiction over Christ, who has liberated us from the law in order that in this way we may live to God. Or, for the Christian, therefore, the entire law has been completely abrogated, whether it be the ceremonial law or the Decalogue, because he has died to it. Or, the entire law has been abrogated for believers in Christ. Bye-bye law. Luther, however, is not junking the law altogether. He's junking it in the article of justification, he says. But by this, we are not asserting that the law is nothing, as they immediately infer, if the law does not justify it, it was given to no purpose. No! The law has its proper function and use. This is not the one that our opponents attribute to it, of course, namely the Roman Catholics, that of justifying. The opponents of the third use of the law might be accused of using logic really not much different from Agricola's. 
after the gospel comes, the law has no place in the church, period. Permit me to offer just one more piece of evidence from Luther. This one just baffles me. I don't understand how people can't get this one. It's very simple. Um, you know, the large catechism. Luther writes these sermons of the large catechism for children and simple folk who are building on their, cate on their catechesis. Yet he begins here with an exposition of the Ten Commandments. Not because he thinks he's catechizing unbelievers. Right? He's not trying to convert people. Large catechism is written for people who are converts. Why this extensive commentary on an application of the Ten Commandments if there's no law for believers? It's a waste of ink, it seems to me. While, of course, our evangelical friends have given sanctification a bad name by describing it, sanctification, as the goal of the gospel, still Luther offers practical advice to Christians about how to put into practice the commandments and how to train the young to do so. My paper has references to the large catechism throughout, but one example will suffice from the second commandment, quoting now. Children should be trained early to shun falsehood. Now this example is all the more remarkable for our purposes because Luther is here explaining the first table of the law. And yet, he has instructions about tr the training of children to shun lying in general. And there's many more examples of this throughout the large catechism. Luther will certainly also call works great and precious, such as obedience to parents and other authorities, large catechism 1, 117. There is a temporal promise of benefit attached to the fourth commandment. You all know it. Luther praises the tidy work of domestic servants. Often this praise of everyday work is connected to the rejection of self-defined human works that are in righteousness in the sight of God touted by the monastic communities. Throughout the large catechism, Luther exhort, exhorts his readers to provide training in godly living to others. In the fifth commandment, Luther disapproves of the piety that derives from the golden rule. Because we Christians are to love those who hate us and do good to our enemies, not just to those who love us. This ethic is ordered and shaped by the work of Christ, who did exactly that when he loved us and gave himself for us while we were still his enemies. The Christological content is never, never far from the surface of Luther's thinking about the law and its applicability. The Christological content ups the ante. The law is being read through and in Christ, once again making clear that this is a Christian reading and application of the holy law. Far from making it irrelevant or not applicable to the Christian life, such a reading makes it all the more applicable and relevant to the ways in which the Christian lives out the life of Christ on a daily basis. And I'll point you to one last reference in the large catechism. In the sixth commandment, Luther says, I speak of this in order that the young may be guided so that they desire the married estate and know that it is a blessed estate and pleases God. First, this commandment is a guide. Lo and behold, Luther has a third use of the law. Second, it is also that his marriage is also to be known as a blessed estate. To be guided by the law and to know what is blessed are both things that those who reject the third use of the law say that the law cannot do. I might say with some irony that it is remarkable that these things are attributed to the law by Luther in the matter of the, well, sixth commandment. At this point, I don't think we need to keep beating this dead horse. Luther treats the law as a tool for the church to guide and direct Christians, and especially children, 
after conversion. You can call this what you like, but it is the third use of the law. A few things about Melanchthon. Both the 1535 and 1543 editions of the Loki Communes, his common topics of theology, include an exposition of the law organized under not three headings, but four. So in a way, Melanchthon actually has four uses of the law. So this obviously is not about numbers, first, second, third, whatever. It's about substance. So, Quoting now Melanchthon. In the first place, the law instructs us as to the purpose for which human nature was created. I love this. This is exactly what we need in our place and time. This is the kind of thing that supports human flourishing. We are God's creation. Therefore, what and who does this make us? This is absolutely essential today in the face of the demonic dogma of gender fluidity. Now, in the second place, the law instructs us concerning our present wretched state. Of course, God has a law that teaches. In the third place, the law by implication quietly instructs us concerning the restoration of the human race and concerning eternal life. This would be our third function of the law. And now in the fourth place. In the fourth place, when we have thus considered how great is the misery of the human race under the oppression of sin, the wrath of God and death, and have understood that the voice of the law is a sentence, a chain, a witness, and that measure, uh, I'm sorry, messenger of his unspeakable wrath, we must always turn in this area to the Son of God and consider his sacrifice, which alone has endured this wrath for us, undergone the burden of the law, and has pleased the Father. So that's rather more like what we would call the second use of the law. In any case, the law may not be tamed by assigning numbers, first, second, or third. That's not the point. It remains the terrifying and threatening instrument of a God who is wrathful against us and our depravity. However you number it is irrelevant. This means that the terminology remains fluid, especially in the Reformation period. Neither Luther nor Melanchthon are tied down to a threefold function of the law, and therefore it's no surprise that the term third use does not often, or perhaps not even at all, turn up in Luther. Again, this is not an argument about names or words. It's an argument about the theological substance. The threefold use of the law in Melanchthon arises as the answer to this question. What is the use, notice singular, of the law? If the works of the law do not merit remission of sins or if we are not righteous by the law. At this point, we need to understand that there is a triple use or three offices of the law. Now that's fully Melanchthon. Nor is this three laws or even three uses, but a triple use, a triplex usus or function of the law. In actual practice, the three uses hold together Often they may not be separated in preaching because the different impacts of the law have to do not with their content, but with the hearing of the listener and not the intention of the preacher. This is why the formula of Concord will say, the law is and remains both to the penitent and impenitent, both to the regenerate and unregenerate people, one and the same law. It is God's unchangeable will. You want to drive the liberals crazy. Keep telling them that the law is God's unchangeable will. They hate that. The difference as far as obedience is concerned is only in the person. Those differing results are caused by the hearing of the audience. Let me just take a simple biblical example. In Isaiah 7, 14, we have the promise of the Messiah to be the Emmanuel. God with us. 
That promise is delivered to King Ahaz by Isaiah. And how does Ahaz take this wonderful promise of the gospel? As a terrifying threat. And so standpoint is pivotal. The word of God does what, the, what God sends it to do. God's law is his to use, not ours to use. The Lutheran basis for offices includes the concept that one may hold several offices at the same time. In my case, pastor, father, husband, and more blessedly, grandfather. The offices of the law may have multiple functions to keep outward discipline, to accuse, to instruct at the same time, or also serially. These functions are all in God's power to unfold when and where it pleases him. So, too, the law remains God's own creature. We do not control it in our preaching. His word is his word. Otherwise, we find ourselves with a first commandment problem. God uses the law, not us. We preach it. The law has various offices, just as a father, as a husband, a parent, and a church member, etc. Different vocations, one person. One law, different offices. Every preacher has had the experience of preaching sanctification and then had the member walk into his office destroyed, brokenhearted, distraught, conscience ruined, because what the preacher thought was sanctification simply accused that poor dear member. The law is the law. It still does accuse. It does so because of our sin. For Melanchthon, the law really has a single use. The title of the locus on the use of the law is De Usu Legis, concerning the use of the law. Chemnitz has a similar locus. Of course, he's following Melanchthon. De usu et fine legis, that is the function and purpose of the law. In fact, Chemnitz calls it the triplex usus, the triple use, not three uses. Now, as I read the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, I have been amazed by the number of references to the third use of the law that show up in it, even and especially in the Article 4 on Justification. I read the Lutheran Confessions every nine months straight through. I recommend this to you. Um, at, at this reading, I'm just going through the Latin, no English. And I've been surprised. I, I read it for something specific every time. Maybe four or five years ago, it was the third use of the law. And I was flabbergasted. I'll give you some of the results now. The distinction between law and gospel shows up right away in Article 4. All scripture ought to be distributed to two principal topics, the law and the promises. By law, we mean the Ten Commandments wherever they are read in the scriptures. The apology praises the law. Again, this is all Article 4. Uh, for God wants wild sinners to be restrained by civil obedience. Of course, that's first use. To maintain discipline. He has given laws, letters, doctrine, rulers, and penalties. To a certain extent, reason can by its own strength perform this civil righteousness. We cheerfully credit this righteousness of reason with the praises that are due it. Now, this would be an expression of the first or civil use of the law. Melanchthon suggests that an incomplete fulfillment of the law is possible, but only under the power of the Spirit. For the law, quoting now, for the law cannot be performed unless the Holy Spirit is received first. We are reconciled to God and counted righteous for Christ's sake before we love and before the works of the law although love necessarily follows. Love to neighbor is an outcome of a true faith. Quoting now, we teach not only how the law can be kept, but also how God is pleased if anything can be done. Good works are to be honored and praised because they are the works of God's kingdom among us. 
to demean such works, and here he specifically means the confession of doctrine, sufferings, works of love, suppression of the flesh, would be to demean the outward rule of Christ's kingdom among people. These good works are meritorious, just not meriting salvation in the sight of God. We teach that good works have merit. Now I'm quoting again from the Apology. Not for forgiveness of sins, for grace, or for justification, for these things we receive only through faith, but for other rewards bodily and spiritual, in this life and after this life. Good works are commanded not to be done in accordance with the Ten Commandments. Quoting, we praise and require good works and show many reasons why they ought to be done. Again, quoting, some outward works can certainly be done. Of course, such outward work can never be perfect in the sight of God and will never avail for righteousness in his sight. Quoting again, a person keeps the law when he hears that for Christ's sake, God is reconciled to us, even though we cannot satisfy the law. When Christ is apprehended as mediator through this faith, the heart finds rest and begins to love God and to keep the law, where people are freed from uh, keeping God happy by their own works, they're free to serve their neighbor by giving to him what is beneficial to him. The ultimate point I'm making here with these extensive quotations from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 4, is to say that the Lutheran Confession that makes the biggest statement about justification in that very article also presumes that obedience to the law is a good thing and ought to be done in accordance with the Ten Commandments. The thing that the Apology of the Augsburg Confession rightfully denies is that your righteousness in the sight of God would come from obedience to the law, which would take glory away from the mediator Christ, who is the entire cause and source of our salvation. Of course, in our time, the opponents of the third use of the law have argued that it is an Aristotelian scholastic imposition through the formula of Concord, and that it betrays the genuine reformation of Melanchthon and Luther. That couldn't be further from the truth. As we've seen through these quotations from the article on justification, Article 4 of the Apology, of course, we readily admit that the term third use of the law is unique to the formula of concord in the Lutheran confessions. But again, the truth is not about words, but about meaning. Obedience to the law as an outcome of faith is a common theme in the Apology, even Article 4. What is that but the use of the law after conversion to Christ? That is, the third use of the law. Junking the formula of concord, as some people want to do, will never get rid of the third use of the law in the Lutheran confessions, not even close. How are we doing for time? Terrible, wonderful, okay. Um, i tell you what, let's skip the formula of Concord because we've really already established uh, the faithfulness of the third use of the law using the apology. I, uh, yeah, because it's walkout uh, history, this is not insignificant. So I've, I pointed out that opponents to the formula of Concord think of it as this Aristotelian even Calvinistic, this sounds so bizarre to me, but as a Calvinistic imposition uh, on Lutheranism. So I have a response to that in the paper. So could it be an intrusion of the stultifying Aristotelian theological method of 17th century theology? This seems to me only to be a later reading back in of something that became hated and execrated by people and this is, it's a 19th century problem, so it's not unique. But for our purposes, people like Yaroslav Pelikan and Richard Kemmerer of Concordia Seminary fame. 
Is the third use of the law an early weed from the seedbed of Lutheran orthodoxy? I think we need a quick boo hiss to Lutheran orthodoxy here. Thank you. I love sound effects. Uh, normed as it is by the Aristotelian theological method. While much more could be said about this, of course, in the end, it was not about the objections to Aristotelianism from people like Kemmerer and Pelican. It was really about a dislike of theological certainty and clarity of proclamation that obligated Christian teachers to teach specific things. The hatred of theological certainty and clarity boiled over at Concordia Seminary St. Louis 50 years ago at the time of the walkout. In the period leading up to the walkout from Concordia Seminary, many worried about the confessions as a, oh horror, straitjacket to talented theologians. Any form of orthodoxy, any kind of theological norm was rejected as an inauthentic appeal to stifling authority, you lousy Missouri Synod Lutherans. A representative, if extreme case, is Richard Newhouse, who, by the way, over the years began to think better of some of this, we'd say to his partial credit today. But in 1969, this is what he writes. A theologian worthy of his stipend can hardly be constrained by either methodology or conclusions by statements of theologians of the 16th century. The ecumenical character of contemporary theology has brought the problem of confessionalism to the fore. That is that it stifled uh, uh, this kind of ecumenism. But it should have been evident before this that any form of authoritarianism, including the way in which confessional subscription is frequently understood, has no place in the theological enterprise. So much for any kind of standard or norm, let alone the Lutheran confessions. By the way, the same thing could be said of the Bible, right? Confessionalism ought to have brought the problem of ecumenia to the fore instead. Newhouse's wholesale rejection of the 16th century confessions is certainly not the view of the confessions themselves about their own purpose. When you create an intellectual vacuum by dismissing the dusty past, fie on thee, Aristotelianism, seven demons worse than the first then might indeed well take up residence in the theological corpse, or should I say corpus, I'm not sure which, this is precisely what happened at, the, at Concordia Seminary from 1945 until the walkout. It is my considered opinion that those who rejected the third use of the law in the LCMS did so not because they were afraid they would lose the gospel otherwise, but because they did not want any binding theological authority or standard placed over them. By rejecting the third use of the law, you might well not just lose the law, piety, sanctification, but even the gospel itself, the person of Christ, and indeed the whole shooting match. Doctrine either hangs together or it hangs separately. This has become clearer with advancing years. Exhibit 1, ELCA. Um, I'm out of time, am I? I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna do this. All right. I had so much fun doing this. I couldn't stop writing. Sorry. Let's see. How many pages have I got left? Oh, this is horrifying. Oh, all right. So here, I want to talk about what what is legalism, right? Often, people who want the third use of the law are accused of being. Legalists. Yeah. So it's essential to establish a definition by what Christians mean by the term legalism or legalistic teaching. Legalism is by definition the attempt to earn righteousness in the sight of God by works. This, by the way, is in the Lutheran Encyclopedia. So it's the most basic definition. Thus, the imposition of the law for the benefit of society, church, or neighbor is not legalism. It may not cross the line, of course, 
by being shoved into God's face is meritorious. Yes, it may be meritorious coram hominibus, that is, in the presence of people. Indeed, good works in this sense merit human praise because they are beneficial to humans. When I was a child, I enjoyed going to my grandparents' farm, which if I timed it right, there were no crops coming in, so I didn't have to work. So I spent my time chasing feral cats, which was not very successful. And one particular beautiful July Ontario morning, I remember opening the door to the back porch of the farmhouse and about to step out and see, oh Lord, it's a dead mouse. Ew, yuck. And what are the cats doing? They're out in the barnyard preening and meowing and smiling their feline smile at me, saying, look what we brought you. This is exactly what happens when we drop our good works on God's back porch. He looks at it and goes, ew. What should have happened? The cat who got the mouse should have taken it to the starving cat at the next farm. Who are your good works for? They're for your neighbor. God doesn't need your good works. By the way, I think Psalm 50 is full of jokes if you're willing to listen for them. Are not the cattle on a thousand hills? Mine, says the Lord. Do I really need Texas-style barbecue? I mean, that's even a liminal question, right? Texas-style barbecue is pretty good. No, he doesn't need it. You need to give Texas-style barbecue to your neighbor, right? That's the point. So, in this way, our freedom from the attempt to coerce God by our works enables us to be fully human and to serve our neighbor, to attempt all for his benefit, because God's not testing us on our good works. God tells us the best way to serve our neighbor through good works that his law presents to us. Keeping law and gospel in their proper lanes is truly humanizing for us Christians in the world. We are not so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. I see the mafia. <laughs> so let me just give you the conclusion. To argue against the third use of the law is to invite indiscipline both theological and moral. It is to ignore the clear use of the law for Christians, the teaching of Luther, Melanchthon, and the formulators of, formulators of Concord. The result of such rejection of the third use of the law will endanger the gospel, make Christians susceptible to tyranny, and endanger the tranquility of the church, state, and family. We cannot entertain such a disastrous outcome. What? The third use of the law again? Yes, again. It must be that way. Thank you. So, Pastor Murray, you wanted to talk about the ELCA, and then you stopped yourself. And I, I don't know if you heard me, but I said I would like to hear yeah. what you have to say about it. So, nothing. Um, and let me just follow up with that by saying, it doesn't need any discussion, whatever. I mean, all you have to do is look at what's happening. Um, I mean, as a parish pastor, I get to see these broken-hearted ELCA people who realize, again, they're like the frogs on the stove and they're being slowly boiled to death. And some of them figure it out and jump out of the pot. Now, of course, when they show up at an LCMS church, they're expecting us all to have <laughs> horns and tails. It's amazing the crazy things they believe about us. Uh, and it does take them a while to work through their manias with you. But you have to be patient with them. You have to love them treasure them, encourage them, 
teach them the truth and say, oh, by the way, there are a whole bunch of Lutherans that still believe that truth. And, and they come over. But I mean, uh, you know, sort of complaining about the ELCA is like shooting fish in a barrel, it seems to me. So, but, cause we'd be here all day talking about it. All right, we got one over there. Yeah, uh, Pastor Murray, thank hey, you Felix. for your, uh, for your presentation. Um, so it's, it's my understanding that antinomians exist as a response to legalism. Um, I've read many articles, blogs, listen to podcasts, and they all, for the most part, understand legalism the way that you had described it in the Lutheran dictionary. Um, you know, looking to the law to justify yourself before God. And I think that's right. I mean, obviously, the scriptures talk about it in that way, that we are saved by faith alone through Christ alone, apart from works of the law. But in practical life, though, um, I've kind of experienced something pretty different. Um, when I see a legalist, I've actually changed my mindset and thinking, if you're a legalist, I actually think the opposite. What law are you trying to break? Hmm. So instead of thinking, well, this person's a self-righteous hypocrite, I'm thinking, what loopholes are you trying to create to circumvent the law so therefore, you're a legalist. Right. Um, we see this exhibit A. Children are perfect examples of this, right? <laughs> Don't touch your sister. You, yep. you know, you put the finger yeah, right. right. How, to, how close can I get? Right. Yeah. And then also within our church bodies in the ecclesiastical realm, um, the online communion practice, every time I hear an argument for online communion, I hear nothing but legalism. Ways to parse out the scriptures or... Jesus' words in a very legalistic manner to say, well, Jesus didn't say that, so yeah. therefore we can do this. Right. So I, I, it, in some sense, there's kind of two parts to legalism. I, I, I rarely hear kind of that aspect of legalism. So I, I view the antinomian and the legalist as one and the same. So. Sure. I, and I think it's really, it's, it, the Pharisees are the, the great example here, right? Um, trying to figure out how they were going to count out 10% of the dill weed on a daily basis. Uh, it's no wonder then that the disciples, when Jesus says, look, it's hard for the rich guy to get into heaven. And they're like, what, what do you mean? I, we thought the rich guys were getting into heaven because they had time enough to count out the dill weed. And, and so they're flabbergasted when Jesus points out the difficulty of getting into heaven if you're a rich guy. That's opposite to their ex expectation because they were all trying to figure out how they could play the game to get there. And so you had all these evasions of various kinds, like Corban as an example. They made up a law for the purpose of, of keeping their, their dollars to themselves when they retire. I'm about to retire, so I understand Corban. Um, but they wanted to keep the money to themselves and not care for a parent, despite the fact that you had a fourth commandment. And of course, Jesus teased them up about this, but you're right about that, absolutely. All right, we got another one right back there. I was just curious uh, what the distinction was that you were making between the triple use of the law versus the th three uses. Right, so just simply to make the point that Lutheranism sees the law as a unit, um, and of course, one of the accusations against people who say there should be a third use of the law is that it's a third kind of law or uh, something like this. It's very odd, these accusations, because there's no basis for them. Um, there's this fear that we're generating a law different from God's law or, I mean, just all kinds of strange things like this. So that's why I wanted to emphasize uh, our father's use of the word use rather than uses. All right, any other questions? You got one in the back. Oh, don't, don't give him the mic. Dr. Murray, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, your, the definition of legalism that you used from uh, the cyclopedia I think is right on. Uh, I've been in the Missouri Senate a long time. I've heard a lot of sermons I thought were not good sermons. 
I've given sermons I thought were not very good sermons. Yeah, um, I share that with you. I, I, I mean honest, about my sermons, not I yours. Honest, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome to come to Warden on Sunday and give yeah, it a yeah. whirl. Um, I don't think I've actually ever heard a legalistic sermon. I, I just think it's a complete straw man. I have never heard a Lutheran Church Missouri Synod pastor stand up and say anything that could be construed as you're going to be saved by your works. Yeah. I mean, I've, I mean, we bend over backwards to say we're, we're saved by what Jesus did. Right. And so I, I think that's just a straw man, which makes the other team even weirder. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have something there. I mean, I, I certainly have heard sermons that so emphasize the law that you lose sight of Christ. And I, that's not good. I, you know, I, I, I love that last thesis of Walther's. The gospel's got to predominate. It just has to. And if it doesn't, it leaves people with uh, wrong impressions, I would say. At, at, at best, maybe it were something else. Yeah, I mean, I would just, maybe part of it is that we have to recognize, as both Pastor Sharon and Pastor Murray, as you both have said, I mean, this is partially an imported problem, right? It's imported from outside of confessional Lutheranism, right? So it's imported from guys like, you know, Gerhard Ferdy, right. who, who see pietism as the real problem, and they see pietism as a kind of legalism, right? And so this, these things get conflated. And then, I, I mean, I appreciated your point that this, you know, he's really operating out of a higher critical perspective. And that's, you know, you can trace that all the way back to enlightenment, liberalism, Schleiermacher, what do you want to do? And then dialectical theology, which doesn't, which allows the professor to wax on right. without really saying anything. And so the problem is, is that Ferdy then gives us language that sounds confessional because he's operating out of a kind of dialectalism that's trying to pull something out of Lutheranism, but it's really not faithful to the scriptures. And so, so it's, it's a whitewashed tomb. It's sure. hollow and it's empty. I mean, I don't know if you have any more comments. On yeah, that. I mean, I, I thought those were important comments of yours yeah, yeah. in the paper. I, I agree with what you say, absolutely, um, uh, Professor Grobin. Very helpful. Uh, the thing, I mean, I've had to read a fair amount of Ferdy, and he, he's really incredibly eloquent. He knows how to wield a pen, and there are things to learn from him in terms of style, no question. But be careful you don't swallow down the poison with the style, because it's there. I mean, and the other thing, I appreciate your point too about the fear of, of um, pietism. I mean, these folks are a bunch of Norwegians. <laughs> I'd be afraid of pietism if I were a Norwegian too, you know? But, uh, the Missouri Synod doesn't have that background. Oh, don't misunderstand. We love our, our Norwegians. Even, you know, even the Preusses, right? Um, but, but they weren't much for pietism either, were they? Um, or are they? So, uh, so but uh, this isn't our history. Uh, we're, not, we're not chased by the, the pietistic demons to the same degree as some of those folks in the ELCA would be, I think. Because they're, in, you know, because of the ALC's strongly Nordic background, it's a different situation. You heard it from the Canadian. No kidding, eh? 